happy to present today Dr. Derek Meghi, who is a lecturer in computer science at the University of Leeds and also the chief technical officer for Heterogeneous, which is a spin-out company that's based on some of the work that we're uh, going to be talking about uh, today. So uh, Derek received a, a PhD in 2000 and his research interests span uh, all aspects of medical uh, image analysis. Um, and he's also interested um, in surgical simulation, um, visual surveillance, uh, analysis of, uh, of remote sensing data, and so on. So Derek is uh, visiting us uh, over the month of March, and so uh, if you're interested in meeting him, he will be available on the ground floor for another couple yeah. of weeks. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I came here two years ago, and I met quite a few of you, um, and I've come back, and I... So in between that time, I've done quite a lot, uh, and some of it's research, and some of it's uh, other things. And as been said, I have two hats, and I come wearing wearing two hats because um, some of what I'm going to talk about today is about the research we do at the University of Leeds. And you've heard, if you came to the last seminar I did about two years ago, you'll have heard some of this. Hopefully, there'll be a little bit of new stuff as well. But since then. We set up a spin-out company, and what we're trying to do is put all the stuff in a box, um, hopefully, so people like you can actually use it. Um, so I'll talk. So this is kind of ha what I'm going to do. Talk about. There's a bit that's kind of a researchy bit at the beginning. There's a bit that's a bit of a spin on the company stuff, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing here because I've been here about two weeks now, and I've been working with some of uh, your images, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the results we've got. So I thought it's quite interesting because. Um, I came here with an idea in mind about what to do, and it's kind of it's gone a little bit sideways, but it's actually quite interesting, so I thought I'd tell you about it anyway. Um, so for those who weren't in my last seminar or have forgotten in the other images, what is digital histopathology? Um, histopathology is the analysis of tissue at the, mi uh, the microscopic level. So typically we're talking about microscope slides. You take a piece of tissue, you section it, you stain it, you put it on a microscope slide. So that's all fairly standard so far. And, and in the past, we would look at it under a microscope. But increasingly in research these days, rather than look at it under a microscope and do qualitative analysis, we're taking it and putting it into one of these slide scanner machines, which looks a little bit like a printer or a photocopier. Um, we can scan these at incredibly high resolution and produce really big color images. So, for example, 100,000 by 80,000 pixels, and these can be uncompressed. They're about 20 gigabytes. They tend to be compressed down by a factor of 5 or 10 to actually fit on the disk. But when you're actually dealing with them and doing image analysis, it's the, it's the 20 gigabytes that you have to worry about. And the thing about images this big is they're really big and you can't fit them into memory. So you actually have to deal with these sorts of images in a slightly different way from rather you know, smaller images such as radiology images where you can just easily you know, and, fast and speedily load them into memory. So typically the first thing you do, and this is actually done generally by the scanner, but it doesn't have to be, is actually store your images as some sort of image pyramid rather than storing them as a single Bing image. You store the, the full resolution version uh, and probably tiled as well so you don't have to load the whole thing and you store half resolution or quarter resolution, etc. So this is um, how we typically deal with these massive images that you have a special file format that allows you to easily access either a low resolution part of the image or a high or a sub image at high resolution. So these are these, you know, of course we can use all the different sort of stainings that we generally use um, in biomedical practice, you know, the kind of standard H and E stains, arterious red or immuno stains, etc. Uh, all of those can go in. And they're in fact, um, while we haven't got them in leads, you can go you can get fluorescent scanners as well. So you can do fluorescent microscopy. Um, so the first part, as I promised, um, was about the research areas within University of Leeds. So I'm going to kind of do a bit of a whistle-stop tour over the last sort of 10 or 12 years of some of the research we've done. So I talked about some of it last time. I didn't talk about some of it last time. So some of it may be familiar, some of it might not. So 3D histopathology. This is something that people in Auckland obviously know very uh, a lot about. Um, it's one of the things that Auckland's known for, but we do it in a slightly different way. So we're, we're using these um, microscopy sections. So we're taking a sample of tissue and we are sectioning it 
physically and putting it on microscope slides. So if we want to make one of these volumes that you see here, we might take 150 or 250 sections at about 50 microns apart. Uh, we'll, we'll put them on uh, microscope slides, we'll stain them, etc. This seem, may seem a lot of work, but it's really, it's probably only like half a day or a day for one of those sorts of volumes. It can be done by a lab technician. It's not something that needs to be done by someone who's paid an awful lot of money. Um, so actually, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it seems slow, but it's not that slow. And it's very practical. And we've done, I think we've done about five or 600 of these volumes. So it is actually practical to do this on, on a reasonably large scale. And we've done, you know, if we really want uh, sections to be very close together, we have done 1,000 section volumes at uh, 5 micron separation as well. So the idea is we're going to use um, image-based uh, registration um, to line all these up because when you put them on the microscope slide you've created CF a problem. If you do the blocks, sort of block face imaging you do here in Auckland you haven't got an alignment problem and you just take the images they're all pre-aligned but if you've sectioned them, you've floated them on uh, the bath and you put on, on the, the microscope slide you've now got an alignment problem. It's not only is it a, a rotation and translation problem, but also there's small amounts of warping in the tissue. So you need to correct for that. So we use automatic image registration methods, and I'll tell you a little bit in the next slide um, about our particular one. And we, we line them up into a stack. And actually, we get really nice results, as you can see from this, um, just by, by doing that sort of slice-to-slice -slice image based registration. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is correct for colour variations, because if you're actually staining 100 or 200 or 1,000 um, images, you'll probably find that there's, there's slight variation. Some will be darker, some will be lighter, etc. And when you stack that off, and this is the kind of the view, to, if you were chopping through the volume, you can see there's sort of a, a variation. You see some are really dark, where the, especially at the top, where this batch of serious red seems to be going off. This is where we started, and it was nice, and it started to go off. And some of them were good, and some of them were bad. Um, but what we can do is correct them in the computer and then you get a nice smooth um, reconstruction in terms of um, continuity so which is easier to do image analysis on and of course then we can do image analysis on these massive volumes and what we tend to do is we treat this volume as a series of images rather than doing purely 3D image analysis like you might do in radiology because uh, what we've got here is very anisotropic volumes you know the, the pixel size within these individual images is much smaller than the distance between the images, typically at best about 10 to 1, and it can be even worse than that. So we typically treat it uh, as a set of different uh, 2D images and do two-dimensional image analysis, and then take the results of that, and we can stack the results. So if you're looking at, for example, staining density, for example, collagen density or cell counts or cell density, etc., you do the analysis in 2D, you can then, the stack, you can then stack the results up and you can visualise the results in 3D. So that's the way we, we, we uh, tackle that problem. Um, and here's some, actually, those, are those movies playing? Yeah. So here's, here's a, some work that was done by Duane, who I've forgotten to put on the acknowledgements, actually, as one of our postdocs. And here he was doing, this is an H&E uh, volume uh, of some uh, engineered tissue. And we can actually separate out the diff two different stains. And we're doing that in 2D. And then we're stacking it up in 3D. And you can visualize those different stains in three dimensions. So one thing to say is that when you're stacking up 150 or 200 or 1,000 images, you really want a robust alignment algorithm. Because if, if one of those alignments fails, then you've got a discontinuity in your volume. And the way we do this is actually, rather than do one image base alignment, we take, up, we take our image, we divide it into, sec into sections. In fact, they're overlapping, which I haven't. And we register that one to that one, that one to that one, that one to do that one. And then we combine all those uh, rigid registrations into a non-rigid registration, which corrects for both the translation and rotation globally, but also the deformation. And if one or two of those fail, it doesn't matter, because the way we combine them is we uh, use a, a robust, robust statistics. And the, and the way robust statistics works is if you've got a set of samples 
and you're putting them together and you're trying to, for example, you're trying to fit a, li a, a line to a, a, set of, a noisy set of data. The idea with robust statistics is you, you combine them in such a way that the outliers don't affect the estimation. And this is exactly the same. We're trying to re uh, estimate a, some sort of transform between one image and the other one and we're saying, well, mostly these registrations pairwise registrations here, which give us a rotation and translation. Mostly they work, but there's going to be a failure rate. There's always, everything you do in image analysis, there's always going to be a failure rate. And this is typically, you know, a few percent failure. It might be, you know, 1% or 2%. But it's small, but it's significant. Um, but, if we can, but if we know that most of them are okay, we can just look for outliers, especially as we're using overlapping patches as well. So this is kind of the reason why our approach is really robust and we can, we can just give this code to the lab technician, they do their sectioning, they load, put them in the scanner, they use the software, they don't, they don't have to come to talk to us computer scientists on a regular basis saying, why is this not work? Can you, know, can you make it work? It, it just kind of, you know, mostly, if you've got nice solid tissue like this, it just works, it stacks up. They press the button, there you go. And that's, that's, kind of, that's the sort of thing, you know, this talk is entitled From Research to Practice. And I think that's a really important thing when we're doing image analysis research, is it's all very well coming up with a nice method that does something complicated. But I can't give it to a lab technician and say, look, here's a really simple interface, load your images up and press go. Then, then you know, how much use is it? If you've got to have someone like me, it really is a rate limiting factor on the amount of biomedical research that can, done, that can be done. So if you can put it, you know, the idea of putting it in a box, and we, you know, we've had this idea for a, quite a few years when we did this in, in an academic context and we kind of extended that into the company. Um, so one, you know, we did that and it was really, it was kind of successful and we did hundred, you know, several hundred volumes in it. And, and the next one, this is the second piece as well, it's something we were doing with uh, Stephen Gilbert, which I know a few of you here know, Stephen's been to Auckland a few times, uh, he moved to uh, Bordeaux and now I think he's in Berlin and he's, um, he had some data of uh, high resolution MRI, so well, could I put my MRI together with these stacks of uh, histopathology images? And I said, no reason why not. So, and uh, the European Union, at about, around about the same time, got this lovely travel grant that, so we could collaborate between France and England and uh, New Zealand. Um, so I spent some time um, developing, extending this work so you could actually align the histopathology images, which you can see here in the foreground, uh, to the radiology images, the MRI. And actually, what we're doing is something very similar. We're using an image-to-image -image registration algorithm. But the thing is, these images look really quite different. The, the radiology looks, in appearance, looks very different. Radiology is black and white. It shows different information. If it didn't show inf different information, there wouldn't really be any point in having two different imaging modalities. Um, but there is common features there. Um, you can see the radiology in the background here. You can see there are some, there's, there's common information and then there's different information. So the idea is that what we, what we do to do the registration is we first map it um, to a representation that, uh, based on what we call emergent tissue classes. So you're trying to say, well, is there some t common tissue classes between these images? Then map the two images, uh, the histopathology and the, uh, the radiology to these, and then the images look much more similar, and then you can just use the same registration algorithm that we were talking about before. And another problem, and this is actually the work of Yi Song, one of my postdocs from a couple of years ago, is can we ha take, you know, when you do histopathology, you make a choice between whatever what uh, stain you're using. You might use serious red, you might use immunostains, you might use H and E, and sometimes you actually want to use more than one, and you can't uh, and you can't put too many stains on the sa actual same piece of tissue, otherwise it just becomes an absolute mess. But one thing you can do is take uh, sequential sections. So if you take a, uh, a section and you take the next section separated by five microns, for example, um, you can put different stains on these and then you can use image-based registration to line them up. And again, we're using exactly the same technique we were talking about in the radiology to histopathology correlation. We, we try and make these images uh, look similar by, by looking for features in them that, that map to get to map to some common tissue class. And here we've got, uh, this is actually a sheep spinal disc, and it's got, um, 
it's an old one and the uh, the, the researchers I was working with were very, were very actually excited that this um, spinal disc was diseased. Uh, I think it's since transpired that most old sheep get, get uh, spinal disease, but they were very happy to see that there was, there was disease in this. And what we were doing in this project, we actually tried seven different types of staining just to see what sort of their information we could get out. And then they were going to feed those into their computational models. So we weren't necessarily going to use all seven in the end, but it was a trial. And so we can do this in 2D, map one section to another, but we can also do this in 3D. So you can take you know, stain one, stain two, stain three, and then start again, stain one, stain two, stain three, and start again, stain one, stain two, stain three, and, and create sort of a multimodal, multi-stain um, volume set. Um, and this is kind of nice in, in terms of doing computational modeling. It can give you an awful lot of information. It can give you information about collagen from one stain, information about cell density from another stain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so. Cell detection isn't a totally new thing. Certainly in cytology, people have been doing it for years. Obviously, histopathology, the images are a bit harder to detect the cells than in cytology because they're not nicely separated. Um, they have all this background. They have some cytoplasm. They have in extracellular stuff. There's, there's all sorts of things going on histology because it's, it's, it's the whole tissue. Um, but we've managed to create methods that can find um, nuclei and more to the point, we've, we've developed computational frameworks that allow us to do this over an entire slide. So, for example, a piece of tissue that's a centimetre by centimetre may have 300,000 nuclei. So we can detect all of those. We can show them on an overlay image. Um, we can potentially uh, classify them in different types. And there's a piece of work that I'm showing here by my PhD student, Joe, from a couple of years ago, um, where we try to link the nuclei types, the, the cell type, to the tissue type. So, of course, there is this relationship that in certain areas you get certain types of cells. And so if you know the sort of area it is, then you can infer something about the, the, the potential types of cell. But also, the other direction, if you know what sort of cells are present, you can infer something about the tissue type. So in the, his PhD project, what he's trying to do is actually solve both problems at the same time and say, well, I don't quite know what tissue type it is and I don't quite know uh, what cell types, but if we put these all together uh, in a Bayesian network, a statistical formulation, then we can actually estimate the most likely explanation in terms of the tissue and the most likely explanation in terms of the, the actual cell types um, that, we're, that we're looking at. And this is, this is human liver tissue that we're talking about here. Um, I've said a little bit about colour consistency before, but a colour consistency in 3D stacks is kind of an obvious, you know, you might want to solve that problem. But actually colour inconsistency in terms of just general images, if you've got a set of um, different histopathology images from different patients or from different hospitals, and you want to perform some sort of image analysis on this, then the parameters of the image analysis may be different. If you've got a very faint stain here and a very deep one, then it's very difficult to tune your image analysis algorithm to work on both of those sorts of images. But if we can do um, stain normalization, uh, we, can, we can actually produce, produce more consistent images, which is much easier to tune your image analysis. Uh, and I've been working with, uh, actually these are, these are liver images again, but I've been recently working with someone in, in Israel and we're looking at collagen quantification and he had uh, lots and lots of images stained with serious red. And you know, when you tried uh, stain quant, he tried a load of different things, stain quantification, and I tried a few things, and actually, you know, 90, 90 95 percent of the time, you could get the stain quantification to work beautifully and on a variety of different methods, but there was always five percent images which 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 would fail. And I looked at these images, and largely they were failing because they were dark ones. They were overstained images. Um, but when we ran the color correction. Um, actually, all those images started, started working, so we could use a consistent set of image analysis parameters to do the collagen quantification on all of the 100 images rather than just 95% of those. Um, this is a piece of work by my current PhD student, he's still going, uh, Alex Wright, and He's interested, uh, along with the doctors in Leeds, in what we call stereology. And stereology 
um, originated without before computer vision. You know, um, it's the idea is can we sample from tissue and can we come up with some uh, quantitative values about uh, a piece of tissue. In particular in Leeds, we're interested in the ratio between cancerous areas in tissue and stromal areas. And it's been proved by uh, the researchers in Leeds and, and elsewhere that um, the, prog the response to therapy, the response to uh, certain drugs and certain uh, radiotherapy treatments um, is different depending on the, the cancer stroma ratio. So you can actually take your tissue, you can measure it like by actually, and what we do manually is create a grid and then some poor doctor goes through that grid and they classify every single point as either cancer or stroma using a, a computer-based user interface. Um, and this is usually someone doing their PhD and it's a very, very tedious task. Um, but the doctors love, seem to love the setting their juniors to do this and we've, got, we've done this on hundreds and hundreds of tissue samples and it's, it's proved some really interesting things about the relationship um, between the cancer stroma ratio and um, prognosis and response to therapy. So, but it, we can't do this in clinical practice. It's just too much effort. It takes you know, several hours to do one piece of tissue. Uh, so what we really want to do is, is use image analysis, use computer vision to do this. And so this is Alex's PhD, is try and take all these. And so we've got a, a lovely training set because we've got lots of examples that have already been done. Can we tr use machine learning and can we train the model to actually class it to do this job rather than a person doing it by hand? Uh, and the answer is um, pretty, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we get accuracies that are not quite as good as the agreement between humans, but it's sort of you know, well up to the 80, sort of 85% accuracy. Um, when it doesn't go wrong, when it doesn't work, it's typically when the, st when the slides are badly stained. So humans are much better than machines at telling the difference uh, between uh, a good stain and a, a bad stain and, and ma you know, making do when you've got a bad stain. So we're not quite as good as the humans yet, but on really nice tissue, we, we're getting pretty close. And we looked at we're looking at different sorts of uh, machine learning. So I'm, I'm going to say, uh, call it what Alex is and Laney do is conventional machine learning. This is where you take a, a little patch around your arrow and you try and create some features. You look at texture features or color features or you detect the cells and you come up with a big vector that describes that area and then you feed it into some sort of conventional machine learning algorithm like a, a random forest or something. But something that's kind of exciting and, and if you go to uh, any conference about image analysis or about histopathology image analysis nowadays, you can't help, someone will, or rather almost everyone there will, will start talking talking about deep learning and uh, convolutional neural networks. So that's something we're, we're starting to play with as well, is, is these, these networks where you don't have to do all this engineering. You don't have to do cell detection and you don't, and color, you know, color representation. Deep learning on neural networks that you just point at your little piece of tissue and you say, that, that bit's cancer, that bit's stroma, and you give it lots and lots of examples. And these convolutional neural networks do everything for you. So we're, we're currently playing with those and see if we can get better results. Because a lot of people have got better, slightly better results using this basically much easier technique because you, you, know, you, you don't have to do very much except tune a few parameters. Whereas here you have to do a bunch of engineering. You have to decide which features you use and watch, which machine learning method you're going to use. So deep learning, everyone's getting really excited about it. Is it, you know, is it going to be the panacea to everything? Are we going to throw away conventional machine learning? I'm not sure. I'm on the fence on that subject at the moment, but I hope so because it makes life a lot easier. So um, I've been talking about um, the research we've been doing, and I've this, this total whistle stop tour I've given over the, the last sort of whatever, 20 min 25 minutes or something. Um, and I was here sitting in Auckland University about two years ago, and it came, it, it, it came to me that really, like we're using this stuff in Leeds, but it's quite hard to get other people to use. When you've got PhD students code and they, they leave and it's, there's a bit of my code and there's, you know, and there's some other code that's a MATLAB executable and some you know, other people have written this. And it's kind of hard to say, look, we've done all this stuff, use it. 
Um, so it came up with the idea of uh, setting up a spin-up company, which it had been in the back of my mind for a while, but it was sitting here in the sun in Auckland that, that made me think, yes, this is something we have to do. So in the last two years since I've been away, uh, we, this has become a reality, and we uh, pretty much have a product now. Um, so this product is a, a, couple of, a couple of people here have already seen this, but I'm really happy to show it to other people. Um, it's a web technology base. So basically, it runs in a web browser. There's a server that does all the processing, and it does the image serving, and then you point your browser at it. Which the really nice thing about that is we don't have to install software on like 100 people's computers. All we do is set up a server, and then any of the biomedical researchers in Leeds who want to use it, or elsewhere, Maastricht, and there's various people using around the world now, they, they don't have to install the software on every single computer. All they do is they make an account on it and they, they send a URL in an email to their users. The user gets on their web browser and they just log on to the system and they can do image analysis. And it's a really nice way, from a system administration point of view, that just makes life a lot easier. So the, the model of the company is that actually the core server and viewer is free, uh, unsupported. Um, because I, I like the people in Auckland, and you host me uh, twice now. Um, Auckland is going to get this software free for a year. So uh, if anyone wants to use it, it's going to be here. I'm not quite sure who's going to be in charge when I, <laughs> I disappear. <laughs> Greg, possibly. <laughs> Everyone's ducking now. But I will leave it. And there's a, apparently a server being organized to put it on as well. So. Um, Bruce or Greg are probably the people to talk to once I've left, but I'm here for the next week and a half, to two weeks, so uh, feel free to talk to me about it as well. Um, do I want to say too much? So, like, I mean, it's got everything you'd expect it to do. It's got an image. It's got an image viewer, and it, it, it's designed to ha to uh, work with really big, these really big images. So, of course, if you, your screen is typically, I don't know, 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, and your images are maybe 100,000 pixels, you can think, actually, the real size of this image is, is from here to, you know, right over here somewhere, right? So you can't actually look at it, the whole image, at full resolution on a standard size screen. I mean, one thing we've done in the past is try and big, build really big screens, power walls. But really, that's not totally practical in, in your average office. So what we've got is well, the standard Google Maps solution is where you can pan and zoom uh, just like you can on Google Maps. Um, it's got annotation tools that work pretty much like Microsoft PowerPoint. It's you know you can do squares and ellipses and and curves etc. And they're all totally editable. So actually, even that's pretty useful. And that's just the free bit. Um, so. You can also convert. One thing, uh, when I arrived here, I said, what format of image, what do you use for your images? Uh, and you guys are using, well, certainly the microscopy people here are using PNGs for images that are 15,000 pixels across, and then clicking on them and waiting a minute for them to load up into, <laughs> into an image viewer. Um, we, PNG and JPEG and these sorts of images aren't, to aren't ideal for, you for when you start to get really big images. 5,000, 10,000, it's all right, it's all right. It starts to get a bit bigger, everything starts to go very slow. So it has the capacity for converting into these tiled formats, which means everything will just run much faster. Um, and also, the idea is that when you start to have large collections of images, you don't necessarily store them all in the same place. Uh, in Leeds, I think we have 500 terabytes worth of images over, that we've collected over the last 12 years. Um, they're not all necessarily on the same computer. So the idea of a virtual file system that makes it look like they're on the same computer, so you can actually analyze them together, uh, is there. Um, but the really interesting bit isn't all that. The interesting bit is image analysis, because you know, the, whole, the whole point in, in doing this sort of stuff is to actually analyze your images, get some information out, perhaps do some computational modeling, perhaps make some sort of conclusions um, about the tissue. So I was saying, I forget, I was talking to a couple of people on the way, and, and this has made my life easier. If, if it doesn't make any money at all, this system has at least made my life easier, because it makes it really easy to write you, uh, user interfaces for image analysis algorithms, which means I don't have to 
worry about writing image analysis use front ends anymore because it's all here. All I have to do is write uh, a plug-in program. A plug-in program is simply a command line program written in any language. Anyone can write those, it's not just me. Um, and it, it can take the images from the web server and it can process them and it can output the results, for example, as overlay images or annotations, etc., etc. But what you really want to know is what image analysis is available. Um, and of course, all this 3D pathology and the multi-stain and the pathology radiology stuff is already in there. So this is first thing to say is it is it is a work you know a work in progress. Uh, image analysis gets added to this um, week by week, and certainly in the last two weeks since I've been here and we've been working with Bruce, we've got uh, a new you know uh, algorithm in there just in the last two weeks. But certainly the, the, al the, al the algorithms for stacking uh, slides up and registering them to different stains and registering them to um, radiology, it's all in there. And there, there is visualization with 3D visualization within the, within the browser. So you've got, here's this data set that I was showing you earlier. Um, and can, it does the alignment and you can see it's nicely aligned. You can do volume rendering. You can actually do that annotations, you can turn into 3D surfaces here. So this is actually all the collagen. You can, it's a clip plane here and a clip plane there. So you can actually combine the, the rendering uh, just within a web browser. So you don't have to install any computer on your software unless you've got Internet Explorer, which you should then throw away and install a proper browser. Um, but <laughs> Um, so, but you know, this is this requires no software installation. All you do is log on to the server. You can, you, if your images are ready on the server, then you can line them up. You can generate these sorts of volumes. You can put them in. If you want to do uh, analysis on them, if you have your computational modeler, for example, you can you can export these volumes. You can export um, the binary annotations as as as, seg as um, Pix map segmentations, binary segmentations. Um, so it is kind of an open system. If you want to get the, the process data out, you can export these as uh, STL um, surfaces. If you want to, you potentially even do 3D printing from this if you wanted to. Although there is a, um, a lot of biological samples aren't totally suitable for, for 3D printing. And if someone, if you're interested in that, I can tell you why and and how we've banged our head against the wall about 3D printing because biology is just a bit complicated and 3D printing isn't quite there in terms of the complexity. But if you've got something simple, for example, it's a heart or you know, um, uh, a nice closed surface, then, then 3D printing is very, very possible from this sort of analysis. So stain quantification. So when, when we first got our scanners um, about 12, maybe even 14 years ago, it came with a little bit of software for counting, for, you know, coloured pixels basically, um, and it was a bit clunky, and you could only run it on a little tiny bit of the image, or you could run it at low resolution. Um, I think we've now gone beyond this, and we can actually do quantification um, at full resolution on the entire slides. So you can take a this might, I think this particular image is about 50,000 pixels across by 50,000 pixels. Um, we've done collagen quantification on the entire slide and we can actually navigate the quantified version just as easily and just as fast um, in the Google Maps sort of way uh, as the, the, uh, the original image. Um, we can also get stats, we can get the, you know, the area, the area ratio. You can break it down by sub, so if I wanted to create a a grid on here. We could actually quantify the individual areas. We, we get perimeters as well as areas, all, that, all those sorts of statistics. And there's lots of different ways of doing it. So uh, stain quantification isn't one thing. You could do it with uh, RGB, you know, sort of color thresholds. We can do it with color deconvolution. We can do it with machine learning time methods. And we can say, and we can define what we mean by collagen and red by example, as well as setting numbers. So you can say, click, 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 click. That's what I mean by collagen. Go away and quantify the entire slide or the entire 100 slide stack or you know, whatever. So this is, this is kind of simple stuff, but I think the, the computational framework allows you to do it on a really large scale. And I think that's kind of the main thing that this 
in terms of stain quantification. It's not like people have never done stain quantification before. Of course they have. It's, you know, it's been, people have been doing it for, for years. But we can now do it at a much, much larger scale than we could ever do it before. Um, and there's some nice tools to um, basically, you, we, once we've got all this information, it becomes key, ta like key value metadata within the database. Um, and so we can actually take a particular area. Imagine we've taken our slide, and I'm interested in the amount of collagen in this particular area. So yeah, I've, I've taken, I've put a box, for example, or a grid around there. Um, I, that particular grid uh, area, I can associate lots of different metadata, tag value, key value metadata. For example, um, proportion of collagen, or perimeter of collagen, or uh, shape complexity, and things like that. And that's, so that's stored in the database. And then when I want to get that out, because at the end of the day, you want to get the data out, and you want to write some papers, and you want to draw some graphs. So we can create these reports, which are basically look like Microsoft Excel. You can press the download button, and you can actually take them into Microsoft Excel, and then you start doing your statistics, and you can correlate uh, different things. And especially, if, for example, if you're doing the MRI to histopathology correlation, you can take statistics that are based on the radiology, for example, the brightness or the, the variance of the brightness or something like that. And then you can take um, parameters from the histopathology, um, for example, collagen and density. So one project we're doing with uh, the, the, the medical physics people in Leeds is looking at uh, different MRI mode um, sequences for actually uh, quantifying collagen. So of course collagen is actually one of the easier things to do in histopathology. We have a nice stain series, red. If it's red it's probably collagen, if it's not red it's probably not. In radiology, in MRI, it's not quite that easy, but um, if you do some clever medical physics, you do a bit of uh, clever uh, biochemistry and uh, for labeling, and um, you can start to see collagen density. And what we can do is validate that against the histopathology, and you can actually draw a graph of uh, a histopathology parameter versus radiology parameter and see if it's uh, some sort of linear relationship or non-linear relationship or if there's no relationship bet between it at all. So this kind of makes that sort of thing reasonably easy. So that's, that's there's two, three parts to this talk, if you remember. There was the bit where I told you about Lee's research. There was the bit that I gave you a spin on the company. And then the third bit, which is uh, the work that I'm doing at the moment in Auckland. Um, and so this is... Um, with Belvin and Bruce and Greg and Mark have been sort of involved a bit as well. Um, so these are bovine cardiac images that come from the Auckland 3D scanner. And you can see they don't quite look like the images I've been showing you so far in that you've got this kind of, because they're block face images, they, these are great, I'm not sure if, how many people are familiar with this technique, but essentially instead of sectioning, putting on a micro slide, putting it under a microscope. This system works by taking um, a block of tissue and imaging the top of the tissue. So you're staining the top um, with your stain and then you're washing it off and you're taking the image in the reflection mode rather than transmission mode, which means this yellow stuff is the wax of the blocks. So when you've taken a really thin section, you don't get that wax because it's so thin it's transparent. But when you've got the block face, it is it isn't transparent, and you have to deal with the uh, the artifacts caused by that. Um, so the so the problem set to me when I arrived is: could you help us with with uh, segmenting this? Because I think we, is, we want to do some computation modeling. Is that what the final result is? Also yeah. Ah, uh, Dane. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll imagine Dane's name here as well. <laughs> okay, so this was the problem that was set to me about a week and a half ago. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit what I've been up to in the last week and a half. This is uh, totally a work in progress. But I thought it was kind of interesting and it was a demonstration of what you could do with the, the, the MIM software that we've produced. And it's just an interesting thing to report results on as well. So. Um, what I happened to be working on when I arrived um, was uh, co uh, colour separation and colour modelling. So colour deconvolution is a technique that's kind of popular in pathology image analysis, whereby you take a piece of tissue and you say, well, this tissue is stained with multiple stains. Can I mathematically separate out 
those stains. And so the way this is usually done, or the, if you read the original paper, it says what you should do is you should take some tissue and you should stain different tissue treated with one stain and work out what the colour of that tissue is. So you take one piece of tissue, if this is, say it was a, a hematoxylin oecin stain, you take, you take one piece of tissue and you stain it with hematoxylin, you take another piece of tissue, you stain it with oecin, and then you'd work, then you'd load it into a program, you'd say, oh, that's the colour of uh, H and this is the colour of E, and you can build the carbon model like this. Um, and we sometimes do that, but it's a bit tedious and it's also a bit error prone because there's colour variation between different stainings, you know, one one day on a different batch of tissue. So you keep having to, re if you do that technique, you keep having to redo it. And you're never quite sure that your single stain piece of tissue is actually exactly the same colour as the multi stain one that you're actually interested in. Um, so a thing we've done quite a lot over the years in Leeds is try to say, well, instead of trying to estimate the colour models, from separate stains, which you know is, involves extra work and is, is problematic because of, their, of stain variation, can we act, actually estimate the colours from the image we're interested in ourselves? Just by saying, if we're clicking on a few points and saying, well, this is kind of a blue-green in this case. There's some purple, and then of course, what I'm doing in this case, and it's not totally correct, is I, I'm, I'm treating wax, the yellow colour, as a separate stain. It isn't technically a stain, but I'm hoping the physics is close <laughs> enough that it's, uh, it will work. And it does rather turn out that, that it is close, the physics is close enough. So we, what we've got here on the top left, so this is the original image with a green segmentation boundary, if you can uh, see it closely. Here we've got a reconstruction of the image using only using two of the three colour channels. So the three colour channels I chose fairly arbitrarily because I didn't totally understand the chemistry um, was a blue-green, um, a purple, which actually turns out to be the same but sort of different, and then the wax as a third one. And what I'm doing here is reconstructing. If I go to colour deconvolution, I get three channels, I get three pieces of information, and you can see this is uh, one channel, or the channel's thresholded. You can see the raw values if you want. But then you can actually go back into the original colour representation. So what I've done here is actually I've I've gone into the the what I call the deconvolution space, uh, the kind of three values for each pixel. You've got uh, blue, green, purple, and yellow. And then I've set the yellow one to zero. So I've got rid of the yellow one and then I've reconstructed. I've gone back into the original representation. And here you can see I've pretty much got rid of all the wax. And there's, there's some purple which may or may not be there. Um, but it works pretty well. Um, you can threshold color change values or take the max, etc., cetera, um, and create a binary mask. And you can actually do uh, some segmentation. And I was reasonably happy with this, but there is a but. There is a problem. Um, whatever you do with colour on a, on a per pixel basis, fat looks pretty much like background. Um, and I've looked at it, I've looked at the colour values, and largely fat looks like background. And it, you can process it how you like, but that's, fat looks like background. Um, so we can't use that information if we want to segment along this line here, which represents the, the boundary between background and the fat of the tissue. So we, and we talked a bit on last Monday or Tuesday when I arrived, uh, uh, it's the edgy information that's important. Uh, appearance information is great in these areas, but it's the edgy information. You can see the boundary line is what we as humans use to tell the difference between the fat and the background. And we use contextual information. So we know because it's next to that and, it, and it's in, next to a particular piece of anatomy, we know that that's the boundary between fat. But it, it's not a local thing. It's not a per pixel thing. It's not even a local region thing. It is to do with our anatomical knowledge. So we need to use both appearance model information where it's available, but also boundary information where it's not. Um, so the solution um, is a, a rather nice method uh, that's been very popular over the last few years in computer vision before, di before um, deep learning got 
in the kind of prior place in conferences, the graph cuts was the latest, greatest thing that people were talking about. And gra um, grab cut is, is a method, uh, a graph cuts type method, whereby you give it a rough initial uh, segmentation. You say, find me a segmentation based on the, the color inside and the color outside being consistent, but also using edge information. And this uses a graph partitioning type um, approach where you, you treat each pixel as um, the, the vertices, a vertex of a graph, and then you, t you basically connect the pixels to their neighboring pixels, and that's, that's the edge. And then you just put it into a graph optimizer. Uh, it labels the vertices of the, of the graph either foreground or background zero or one. So it's just a piece of mathematics. Um, and so here, we're just literally going click, 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 really rough and ready uh, annotation, just you know, close, close to the edge, but not taking hours and hours to do it. And then we're putting it through the grab cut, and we're, say, and we're saying, like, can you refine it? And this, if, if I was to edit this, and I could see like there'd be a lot more boundary points. It's a lot finer. Can everyone see that sort of green line? How it's hugging the contour a lot more than our rather rough and ready initial segmentation. It's a much better fit. Um, it's also really fast. If you do it on fairly low resolution images, it's almost instantaneous. Uh, it's probably less than a minute for a, really, for a pretty, you know, several thousand pixels by several thousand pixels, which um, there are other sort of methods that do fairly similar things. You might have heard of like uh, level sets and um, snakes and things like this that would on, on large images take a really long time to, to run, whereas this is, say, for up to 1,000 by 1,000, it's almost instantaneous, this method. Um, so we've, I've told you about two things I've done so far. The grab cut is currently working just on the RGB. It's not using any of this color separation. Um, there's, it, it largely works. There's a few little issues where the, the contrast isn't very good that, that kind of need looking into. Um, but, and so it's like, well, you know, could the color processing actually make it better? Could we use deep learning, uh, use Kali and texture to make this better? And we will see. I'm here for another week and a half, and uh, I'll do some more experiments, and uh, we'll see where we are at the end of the... Because we want to actually segment not just one image, but a whole stack of a thousand of these images. Um, also, drawing a rough... You know, it's a rough and ready uh, annotation is all very well drawing it onto one image, but actually, Belvin doesn't really want to be doing that for a thousand images. It might take him <laughs> a rather long time. Uh, so we're, talk we're thinking about ways um, of, of doing this more automatically. For example, um, using the result of one image to initialize the grab cut on the next image, um, or having some sort of, so we don't have your know, cut and paste from one image to another one. So we don't have to have a thousand of these rough and ready uh, annotations. Um, and yeah, so this is, so I I've, been, I've got about 20 images out of the thousand image uh, slice because I don't have enough room on my computer for all of them. Um, and here is the results that we've got so far, we've got, we can put, stack them up into the volume viewers. So you've got the, uh, the three standard views and the volume rendering. And here we're combining this, this, these annotations that we did automatically. I've cut, cut it off there just so you can see everything. And I've cut the other image that way just so we can see it's, it's 3D. Um, it's getting there. Um, week and a half. Um, We've got another week and a half left, so let's see and see where we are in a week and a half's time. Um, I think that, that brings us to the end. Um, yeah, um, Dwayne should be on there as well, um, who did the work on the 3D stain quantification. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Questions? Yep. So in your image analysis, when you're stacking these things up and yeah. you're aligning everything, what kind of resolution can you get? Can you follow a 5 uh, micron capillary so you're, you've got different resolution in the X and Y than the Z. So in the X and Y, you could, uh, we typically use 0.5 micron resolution. But the maximum you can get without going to things like plastic embedding um, between is about five micron, and we typically work lower than that. I mean, the ones I was showing are more like 20 or 50 micron between. So 
The answer is, if it's going straight up, yes. <laughs> if it's going across, you might lose it entirely. Uh, so this sort of data is heavily anisotropic, um, and that's just in the nature of it. You, you know, you've got some really nice resolution in the slice at 0.5 micron. We can even go higher than that. We can go to 0.25 micron, which shows some interesting stuff. But I don't. If you do, we have done some plastic embedding that's got the individual sections down to 0.5 microns. But you need a lot of 0.5 micron sections to actually make a decent amount of tissue up. It's also, it, it, the processing is a lot harder when you do plastic embedding. You do special microtome, it's, it's more time consuming. But it is possible. If you were willing to put the money and the time in, it, you can get higher resolution, but we don't typically. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Do you have an estimation of the accuracy and the failure rate of the image registration algorithm? So the accuracy, um, I was measuring actually the, the multimodal. I wasn't measuring the other day. Um, on a good on a good day, you can get uh, twenty microns on the multimodal. And pixels, how many pixels? It's so you're talking about on the multimodal. You're talking about a tens, a few tens. Mu it's much. It's it's better on the the unimodal. So if it's if it's sta just stacking up the same stain. Yeah, 10, 20 pixels. So it's 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 you can you can see, uh, you know, it's it's yeah maybe t 10 microns or something, maybe even less. It's it if you get lucky, it depends on the tissue itself. Um, but it's 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 all it's it's measured in microns. Not uh, and what was the size of your sub images, your patches that you chose for your? It, oh, so the, actually, what the one thing I didn't explain about is it, it gets done on a multi-resolution. So you start off at low resolution. So I typically use about 250 by 250. But that 250 by 250 represents a different area depending on what resolution you, you're at. So you start off at low resolution. You've got 250 by 250, and then you you go to the next resolution up using the the previous result as initialization and then you've got obviously four times as many at the next level and then the next level you've got four times as many again so you end up with quite a lot of them but yeah so, they, they, so they fit, the number of pixels is fixed I think I use 256 actually. So don't, you don't expect to have very regional changes or deformation? No so one of the reasons this actually works quite well is because the, the, the it, it doesn't actually compensate for, for massive do deformations so one technique that we've come up with, which is not a computational technique, is saying well, let, if, if, a, if a section is really, really deformed, like really warped horribly, we throw it away. And the fact is, so and the, what you were talking about, about resolution earlier, so we typically do I don't know, 25 microns or 50 microns between successive images, but there's actually a lot more sections you can take between that, which means we can actually throw away a lot of sections and say let's wait till we get a good one. Um, and that, that means that we don't actually, like, there is non-rigid deformation. You can really tell the difference by doing the non-rigid deformation. But it's not a huge non-rigid deformation um, because we've quality assured the, the, the data preparation. Thanks. Bruce? Just <coughs> very yeah. quickly. Yeah. So yeah. Later yeah. Just a question, though. I mean, how yeah. do you... Well, yeah, another area where very, very large images are being created is in the area, for instance, of light sheet imaging. Have you thought of, of using your tools? I'm happy to uh, look into it. I, I don't actually have any, <laughs> any collaborations in this area at the moment. We talked about it last time here, didn't we? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you doing some light HE imaging well, now? Well, we, we are having to do something along those lines, but there, there's certainly a lot of people doing it, particularly in the neuroscience area. Um, I'm really happy to talk to people on it. It's a huge volume. Yeah. And the, and the question that, there is just how do you handle such, such volumes? The, the theoretically, this, this isn't limited because you're never loading the whole data into memory at the same time. Um, obviously, you know, the larger your image, the longer you have to wait for the results. But there is, shouldn't be a limit on you know, how big you can get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're doing MRI um, to histology images, one of your big problems is shrinkage. Absolutely, so I can tell you about shrinkage. <laughs> so, yeah, I was wondering how you handle it because obviously it's also uh, non-linear. 
depending on the type of tissue or whatever. Okay, so we assume it's linear, but we do take into account shrinkage. And what I found with the, the rat heart tissue, which is the main thing I've looked at, is it shrinks by about 10% fairly uniformly. Right. Um, so you, you, you have to compensate for that. 10% is quite a but lot. You can yeah, compensate. you compensate. There's a little. So the, in the man, there's, a, there's a manual alignment bit and there's an automatic alignment bit. And the manual bit has a slider that says how much it's shrunk. And it's almost always about 10%. Uh, the automatic has a parameter which is optimized. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Other questions? So, so one of the difficulties with the discrimination between the, the fat and the wax, for instance, is the, uh, you know, the closeness of the color. But you're using a three color um, acquisition is there hope for using, say, a more hyperspectral approach to discriminate? If we can do, so this particular technique is limited to three colours because of the way it works. We've actually developed a technique in Leeds, in uh, actually Dwayne I was telling you about earlier, that can deal with an arbitrary number of colours. Actually, hyperspe so hyperspectral imaging actually separates it out into bands anyway, so this program won't currently deal with it, but the yes is, is great. People have done this sort of stuff and I've seen um, talks when people have, have used hyperspectral microscopy and it's, it's very powerful. But then you have to have a visualisation problem because if you've got 256 bands rather than RGB, then you have to say, well, how do I actually explore that data? And people have looked into that problem. But you've only got a limited number of tissues. Yeah, so you, if you know where, which, which frequencies your tissues uh, or your stains uh, are at, then you just take those limited number out. Uh, but there's actually a bunch of research on trying to take, you know, saying, well, actually, I just want to explore this because I don't really know what's in the tissue. Uh, and I've got, say, 256 different frequency bands, which I can't put on the screen at the same time. Can I somehow explore those? And I saw a really nice talk a couple of years ago about a technique for doing that. If there are no further questions, let's thank Derek for a very interesting talk. <laughs>